Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about intercultural communication and some of the difficulties that often arise. In other words, why can't we all just get along? My guest today is Dr. Aaron Cargyle. Dr. Cargyle is a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies. Welcome, Aaron, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Great, thanks for having me. Why don't we start the conversation by giving some terminology and some definition to what we mean by intercultural communication. Mm -hmm. This can run the range of uh, superficial interactivity in terms of body language and encountering people from different groups than the group we're from. Mm -hmm. It also entails having important conversations about substantive matters with people from completely different backgrounds and completely different life experiences. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we get to that level, we're going to experience some difficulty from time to time. If you could perhaps facilitate the conversation by identifying some of these barriers, I think that would help. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the main barrier that we're dealing with is, uh, is the unknown. Um, when you see somebody who you think uh, you're not connected to in some way, then there tends to be a little bit of anxiety about that difference. Uh, and when you're not sure, you know, sort of who they are and how they see themselves in the world and what your potential relationship is to them, that creates a little bit of uncertainty and anxiety. And that seems to be um, a really important, not the only, but a really important barrier to, you know, having effective interaction. And oftentimes we find intercultural, intercultural communication to be rather awkward. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm going to assume your answer to that is going to be the fact that we like to live within our own comfort zones. And yeah. by that, I mean, I'm comfortable hanging out with the people that I hang out with that essentially think the way I do and live the way I do and uh, have the same background that I do. And when I have to extend out to another group, it's awkward because maybe I don't have the experience. Maybe I don't quite understand all of the cultural dynamics of the individual I'm interacting with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the benefits and beauties of culture. Uh, it makes me comfortable. It's, uh, you can think of it as sort of, you know, a home cooked meal, as it were. You know, people crave these foods that aren't necessarily good for us, but we're attracted to them because they make us feel safe and comfortable. And that's one of the benefits of culture. It is uh, a way that we embody, that we take uh, with us through the world. And um, it makes us feel like we know what's going to happen so that when we encounter that, that other from, uh, you know, a place and perspective that we don't understand, it, it can be very um, unsettling. Well, let's talk about the concept of listening mm. because we've all been told we need to be better listeners. But what does that really mean? What is the most important aspect of listening? Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a big one for me because I think that's probably the single most important thing that you can learn to do to facilitate better intercultural interaction is just to listen. Now, certainly there's a lot of things we can do in terms of learning new skills and habits, learning a new, a new language, uh, understanding other different cultural rituals. Um, in addition to all that though, I think centered around all that is this notion of listening. The most important and effective thing that you can do is learn to listen to somebody um, regardless of you know, whether you know their language or whether you know their customs or whether you know their background, their perspective, their identity, if you can just listen, listen to them and take them in for who they are, um, that's going to be the single best thing you can do. Also, interpretation of what people are saying is important. And I have an example of that that was brought to me by producer Laura this mm. morning about uh, a word, a Japanese word, Mokusatsu, mm. which was used during the time of the Potsdam Declaration in um, summer of 1945 at the end of World War II, mm. the Allied powers had met and were demanding an unconditional surrender from the Japanese. And the Japanese uh, Premier Kentaro Suzuki responded with the word Mokusatsu. Mm. And there are different interpretations of what that word means. Uh, the interpretation that he probably meant was uh, to remain in a wise and masterly inactivity. In other words, no comment until we can further digest this. Mm. But there's another interpretation which unfortunately was probably uh, adopted by the Allied powers and that one was uh, to treat with silent contempt. Mm. And so when the Allies uh, feared that their 
declaration was being treated with silent contempt, mm. that's when they sprung into action and 10 days later mm. Hiroshima was mm. leveled. Mm. So you can see that just even interpretation of what a word means can be difficult. Yeah, and that's a great example because that's the, the, that's the sort of moment of intercultural contact. So you have this, you know, you have these two others position in relation to, to one another and, and what do they make of that space? What do they make of that that moment of betweenness? Is this silent contempt? Is this processing? Is this listening, really trying to take in what someone else is saying? And I think it, it, it illustrates, I'll say, our human nature. Ne recent neuroscience is beginning to reveal that we have fundamental part of our aspect, um, of our biology, of our physiology, of, of our brain structure that is oriented toward protection, defense, and safety, the amygdala, for example. We have other parts of our biology and physiology that's oriented toward compassion, care, understanding, mirror neurons that are, that are uh, you know, more dense on the left hemisphere of the brain. And so in that moment of silence, do I go with my defensive protective side and interpret you as sort of scheming how to take advantage of me? Or do I go with my compassionate, caring, connected side and really sort of listen and process and really try to take in how you are being in this moment? Um, and which way we go, it's a great example because which way we go, as this illustrate, depends a lot on how we interpret it and sort of how we are in the world. It's oftentimes less about them, the other, and more about us and how we frame it and see it. Okay, so we know that we need to be better listeners. We know that we need to have some empathy for the speaker. We need to try to um, moderate our reaction so that we're not uh, unintentionally offending someone. But what happens when the person we are communicating with is saying something that I don't agree with, mm. and in fact, it may conflict with my deepest core values? Mm. Mm. What do we do then? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would kind of like to kind of take your question in its entirety, the notion that, you know, we have to listen or that we, you know, have to be empathic and caring. Um, I would say that we don't necessarily have to, that those are options, that multiculturalism is a path, intercultural dialogue and connection is a possibility. I think it's one with strong positive outcomes and advantages, but I think opening it up as one possibility allows us in this instance to be a little more gentle with ourselves if we find a reaction of anger or annoyance. And if we can find some compassion for ourselves in that and allow, us to be, allow ourselves to be angry and annoyed, then we can find compassion and permission for the other to be who they are. So as I find myself being annoyed and, and, and you know, bothered by what you say and how you are, if I've learned to develop compassion for myself and my anger and my annoyance, then maybe I'll be a little bit more compassionate for you. So I think how we see ourselves and how we see other people are intimately connected. And I would say it's okay. It's okay to be annoyed. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to struggle with a moment of difficulty um, and not knowing you know, what you should do. Um, giving ourselves permission to be in that unfinal, um, unresolved space is a big part of the journey because when we rush to judgment about ourselves and other people that's when we cut off the dialogue. And I think one of the problems in our culture today is that we seem to have this take no prisoners approach mm. to the political dialogue mm. that goes on around mm. us and that brings up another question which is can we really agree to disagree mm. and in that context can we agree to coexist mm. where both can live peacefully and happily mm. And how does that happen without surrendering our convictions and core values? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because I think you, as you sort of framed it, a big problem um, or a big difficulty to intercultural, effective intercultural interaction is the sort of sides that we're positioned to take. You know, I've got to, I've got to have a side in this. I've got to find what's true and what's right and what's wrong. And we're often encouraged to do it in, in, in sort of a, a moment of, um, um, you know, speed and efficiency. You know, you've got, to, you've got to quick hurry up, decide how to do this. This is how our media works, right? Talking heads, everybody presents their side in a three minute clip and you're on to the next thing. The most effective thing you can do if you really want to dialogue is create space and create time. Create an opportunity to explore uh, what's going on with you and what's going on with other people. So I think a big part of it is recognizing that m most often our cultural 
condition and setup in the 21st century in the United States in particular, um, it's really hard to have these conversations because we're not really prepared. We're <laughs> got to move on to the next thing and it doesn't happen quickly and it doesn't happen overnight. The term multiculturalism is used a lot these days. Uh, the truth is America has always been a multicultural society. Uh, and by its very founding, people were immigrants from other places. The Native Americans, of course, were here before the other immigrants, but uh, ultimately everybody migrated here at some point. Uh, and we are known as the melting pot and also the salad bowl and a variety of other analogies to describe it. But we also have coinage that states the Latin phrase e pluribus unum, mm -hmm. which means roughly translated from Latin, from the many, one. Mm -hmm. And the idea there, of course, is a sense of unity, unity of purpose, unity of values. And when you come to America, no matter where you come from, you should be part of the American experience and be unified. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, a lot of folks from uh, the World War II generation, what is referred to commonly as the greatest generation, went through a number of experiences with the Great Depression and World War II. And speaking about World War II, many, many times they will say, what I miss most about World War II was the sense of unity that we had, the sense of purpose, that we all felt that we were together on this. Mm -hmm. We were all in it together, and we all felt a duty and a responsibility to contribute. And um, they say they miss that. I will also add, though, that uh, the vast majority of those folks will also tell you as the conversation deepens that it didn't last very long after the war was over. It seemed just a few short years later, people were starting to go their own separate ways. Um, how do we sort of put this all together so that we can have a sense of unity without the extreme threat of war hanging over our heads. Yeah, and that's why I think multiculturalism is a great value in this context because the sense of war, the sense of unity that arises in the context of war depends upon having another who is being subject to our hatred and our antipathy. So, you know, the internment of Japanese Americans, we had the profiling of Muslim Americans after 9-11, we had that sense of unity, but we had it at the expense of, of certain others. And so multiculturalism as a value creates a sense of community, allows us to create a sense of community, but it does so under different terms. And the terms of that community are learning to accept other people for who they are. And so this is a big misconception. People think that community depends upon homogeneity, us all being the same. And I present to you the idea that more long-lasting communities are built on difference. When we can learn to negotiate our differences and trust one another in the context of our differences, a more robust and long-term community can be built without excluding other people. We're going to have to take a break. It's a great thought to take a break upon, so we're going to do that now. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the reactions uh, Aaron's students have had in his classes. Stay with us. There's a world of opportunity available through the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Would you like to move ahead in the field of human resources and personnel management? Sign up for the Human Resources Management Certificate Program. You'll learn how to expand your knowledge and skills and advance in this dynamic industry. For more information, contact the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly at Cal State Long Beach. My guest today is Dr. Aaron Cargyle. Dr. Cargyle is a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies. Aaron, before we went to the break, you were talking about the value of multiculturalism and how this can actually help build a sense of, un of unity in the country today. And you have a phrase that you use called adding without contradiction. Yeah. Tie that in. Yeah. So this idea that sort of related to this notion that we all have to be homogeneous in order to build a community. We all have to be the same and have, be like-minded and like-interested. Um, when we encounter difference, it's sort of as if we need to decide, well, what value is right? What experience is right? Is my value or experience right or is your value or experience right? And so the notion of adding without contradiction allows for a community where there are multiple values, where there are multiple perspectives, where there are multiple experiences, and can we allow ourselves to build a community where these many possibilities exist? I'll give you an example that oftentimes comes up in my class with regard to race. So I'll have students of color talk about their experience of 
being in their mind and their experience racially profiled and getting pulled over by the cops for driving as an African-American. And then I'll have other students that sort of take exception to that and say, you know, well, I'm in law enforcement or my dad's in law enforcement and, you know, he, or, he doesn't profile and, you know, this just doesn't happen. And so adding without contradiction isn't deciding who's right, you know. Do, does, does the color of your skin affect how you're treated by police, right or wrong, true or false? Um, it's more about the, the possibility and, in fact, the reality that both these things coexist. Is it possible we live in a world where the, skin, the color of your skin still matters to some extent? Yeah. Is it possible we live in a world where the color of your skin does not matter? Yeah. Like both of those realities can coexist. And so this is the notion of adding without contradiction that your reality and someone else's reality, although different, can be equally true and can coexist. What do you do in your classes that gets students so energized? Yeah, I talk about real life. Yeah, that's the thing. They, that's part of the, the, the most common con, con, comment that they make is that, you know, I'm thinking about this class when I leave because everything that we talk about applies to their everyday experience, whether it's, you know, how professors treat them or whether it's watching the media and who, you know, what kind ways in which things are discussed and profiled. Um, they leave the class with, a, with an understanding that this is real life and primarily because they talk, they have a voice. The class, my goal is to facilitate their conversation. That's my number one priority because they learn most effectively when it's coming from them, not from me. And it's not always comfortable either. No, absolutely not because as we were speaking earlier, we're taught to choose sides, we're taught to do this in a sort of ideological and hurried manner. And so it's pretty easy when you open the gates to get to this conversation. You can imagine the conversation about, you know, the, the, the student whose father's a policeman and the African-American student who gets pulled over by the cops. You can imagine that's not an easy conversation to have. Um, so it can get contentious. And so my goal is to provide them a way to have that dialogue that they can open up their experiences to, to one another. So they adding without contradiction, literally, literally I stop them and I say, ha, say and, right? Because it'll usually be this and this and this, but, and they'll sort of contradict, you know, this position that they presented. And, and I want to say and, you know, say and. And so there's other things that I'll do, have them speak in their own voice, you know, in my experience. Because when I frame things as my experience, that allows you to have your experience that's different. So there's techniques that I use to try to facilitate that conversation and, and turn down the animosity a little bit and open up the possibility of connection that's there. I have some comments from your students, and I'm going to read from those comments. Mm. Uh, one of them stated, I think what I'll remember most about this class is the idea that all the new things we've learned can coexist with our existing beliefs and values, mm -hmm. which is what you've been talking about mm -hmm. today. All I remember thinking the very first time Dr. Cargyle pointed out this concept was, what a brilliant idea. And I thought it was something that I very much agreed with after thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has their opinions and ways of looking at the world, and they don't have to be wrong just because they just because they disagree with me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, you were referring earlier to World War II. My grandfather served in World War II, and he was taken prisoner of war by the Germans. Um, and he had very different views on religious and cultural and ethnic and racial diversity than I do. And I think part of the beauty with adding without contradiction is to allow him, allow him to have those views because he lived in a very different world than I lived in. And you know, it's okay that. He thinks negatively about certain groups based on stereotypes because that was his experience. Now, I, I you know, would want, he's since passed, but want to engage him with some conversation and allow him to see some other points of view, but to accept him as he is a member of the greatest generation who fought in this war. Um, and part of that, part of that heritage is, are these outgroup uh, stereotypes and prejudices, and, and that's okay. That's, that's who we are as a nation. Another comment from a uh, different student said, uh, I felt that all of the discussions and personal stories I've heard recently have really moved me into a place I've never been before. It is an uncomfortable and painful place um, that many people choose to avoid throughout their entire lives. Although this place is uncomfortable to be in at times, I am still so very grateful that I have the ability to really listen and take in other people's opinions. Yeah. So. Again, when we deal with each other at the superficial, got to move level, 
it, it's really sort of splitting off ourself because as much as we condemn somebody else for having this point of view that is different from ours, you know, um, uh, we, a lot of our animosity and anger is, is really coming from a sense of discomfort and disease that we have in the back of our mind and in the back of our experience. Um, you know, I think just very broadly about a lot of folks who are uh, sort of have anti-gay prejudices, it's not uncommon that they themselves are revealed to have, you know, same-sex relations and sort of, sort of their prejudice and vitriol is coming from their own sense of discomfort about this. Um, so, you know, it's difficult and it's challenging. And if you can allow the space to experience the fullness of your own emotions and allow other people to do the same, there's, there's a lot of connection and healing that can go on. Let's talk about another thing that I'm sure happens a lot when students leave your classes and they've had these experiences. Uh, what happens when a student goes home at the end of the semester, uh, sits down with mom and dad and the extended family and they have this very lengthy conversation about what they learned in your class and they will say things to their parents like this. They'll say, you know, Dr. Cargyle really opened up my mind and he made it clear that all we really need to do is understand one another and be more empathetic and get rid of all of our old attitudes and old prejudices and if we just do that we can make a big difference and we can have world peace and so on and so on and maybe there's a little too much enthusiasm there uh, for the parents. The parents look at each other and say what are they doing to our kids in college these days and are we paying for this and this Dr. Aaron Cargyle must have a lot of crazy ideas that he's foisting upon our students. Um, so how do we um, deal with that kind of situation in terms of trying to communicate effectively so that we don't actually cause the uh, communication interchange to become worse in the yeah. short term. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the energy and enthusiasm is great, and it also has a downside, as you pointed out. I like to remind everybody, you know, it took a lifetime of experiences for you to get to this place, and, it, and, and authentic change doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. So we as a country, for example, have spent 361 years living under law of, uh, of a racially segregated and discriminatory laws from slavery to um, apartheid, Jim Crow era treatment, 361 years. We are 45, 46 years out the other side of civil rights. We've lived under law equally for only 46 years. It's not going to be undone overnight. 46 years does not make all the discriminatory treatment go away. So it's the same thing with our own personal journey. Um, you know, you're not going to go home and convince your parents, and ultimately that's not the point of this. The point is not to convince other people of your view. The point is to open up your views and experiences to their views and experiences. So if you can accept your parents for who they are and where they're at and open up, share your experiences with them, but not in a demanding way that insists that they change overnight because they're not going to. This leads to another point I want to bring up, and that is the concept of a transformational psychology. We talked before uh, today's taping about um, a person that wrote a book called I Believe. Uh, his name is Eldon Taylor, but he wrote a book called I Believe and what, what You Believe Matters. And at the end of the book, he has a little segment that he wants people to recite so that they uh, remember it. And it starts out by saying, I believe in peace. I believe in the sacredness of life. I believe that all life is sacred. I believe that there is a future for our children. And then it goes on, and I'll close with a little bit here at the end of uh, what he provides. And he says, I am loving. I am caring. I am sharing. I am helpful. I am healthy. And I am happy. Your thoughts? Yeah. Um I, I think that's a beautiful affirmation because as I spoke earlier, we have both of these sides to our nature. And as much as I'm loving, caring, and happy, I'm also angry, upset, and isolated. And I think, um, I think that's an important thing to do to remind ourselves of the sort of positive aspects of our being and our experience because neuroscience is telling us re most recently that we, can't, we tend to get drawn in by the negative, 
Negative emotional reactions are more quick and more easily triggered than positive emotional reactions. Um, and so there's really uh, a emerging uh, understanding that we need to practice these good aspects of our nature because they're harder to cultivate. They need, it's sort of like, what's the difference between a weed and a flower in your garden? The weed just grows easily, but the flower, you've got to cultivate, nurture, water. And I think that's what we really, what we're learning, we really need to do with our positive, empathic, connecting emotions. So I would really support remembering that every day. One last thought, and this comes from Martin Luther King Jr., and he talks about service as the antidote to anger, fear, and frustration. And he says, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to know the second law of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Wiser words were never spoken. It reminds me of Helen Keller. I don't remember the exact quote, uh, but something that, you know, I can't do everything, but I refuse to do the thing that I'm only one, but I refuse to do the thing that I can do. We can all do what we can do. We'll end on that thought. Thank you so much for being with us and keep up the good work with the students. Great. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Join us again for another episode soon. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.